Hello, everyone, and welcome to Polymorphism in Object-Oriented and Python. The objectives of this video is we're going to talk about polymorphism. All right, uh, we'll get into that a little bit, and then we'll talk about polymorphism in VB, kind of like what I've been doing with the other videos in regards to at least sharing how VB kind of looks at these things, so you can kind of look at the different language. And finally, how we do it in Python. All right, so let's get to it. Uh, once again, uh, like it's the encapsulation, I basically showed you this, uh, or shared with you this particular slide, which basically says that polymorphism is now basically the last thing we need to cover in regards to the four, four pillars of object-oriented development. Again, we haven't really talked about abstraction. Go out and look around about abstraction yourself. A, a, abstraction is more, a, not a programming tool, like how you program inheritance and encapsulation. Abstraction is more of a uh, characteristic of object-oriented, really meaning a black box, okay? <coughs> and the fact you need to instantiate the uh, the actual uh, uh, object, that's really what it all means. But polymorphism is really one of the final pillars uh, when we talk about opportunities for optional programming in your classes. And, and the whole goal of polymorphism, though it sounds complicated, is actually fairly, fairly simple. Uh, how Python deals with it is very simple, matter of fact. How other languages deal with it is a little bit more detailed, but nothing too complicated. So hopefully I do it justice once again in this video to help you understand. All right. Uh, once again, I put this slide in here just from the mere fact to make sure, once again, as you're reading, le uh, learning about these things and you're learning about Objigorian, I just want to keep stressing, we're developing classes, okay, that our app application programmer is going to use. You may keep asking, Bob, why do you keep saying that to me? Well, because I want to make sure you're not develop you're thinking you're developing an application program like you did earlier in this course or in Programming 1 or in Programming 2. That's not what we're doing. We're developing classes and going to be testing these classes for application programmers to use later on. If you're finally getting that or you already gotten that, yay. If you haven't, please listen to that one more time. Uh, we are not developing anything in the rest of this course that really pertains to the end user here using it. It's all around this, okay? So just one more reminder uh, to help you better understand what it is we're trying to do. If you have questions on that, please contact your instructor and make sure you get that down, okay? It really will help, all right? So let's get into it. Let's get some what Wikipedia says about uh, polymorphism. Well, in object-oriented programming, polymorphism refers to a programming language's ability to process objects differently depending on the data type or class. More specifically, it is the ability to redefine methods for derived classes. All right, it's the ability to redefine methods for the derived classes. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's talk about it a little bit more. <laughs> so. Simply, it's the ability to develop methods that can handle different numbers of variables in its signature and also different data types. So what does that mean? Okay, so first, I basically state that, that what we're saying here is, is that we can develop a method that based upon what is sent to that method, okay, being how many different types of variables are sent to that method. I should actually say arguments, we should say, to that method. Uh, it will handle that accordingly. And so what we're doing in, uh, what we're gonna probably be doing in a class is basically making it easier to, de to develop one method to morph into doing many things based upon what the application programmer sends us. Does that make sense at all? Let's keep going here. But make sure you completely understand uh, uh, what uh, polymorphism is all about. And I, I keep saying uh, you need to understand what the term signature is, okay? I'm sure you have heard that term before with, as we instructors throw it out there. But I, for, to understand polymorphism, you really must understand. First, let's look at a VB program. Okay, let's see here if I have one up. Hopefully, I do. Uh, and we probably do here, okay? Let's see. Oop, I'm going to go to another one. Sorry about this. There you go. So here's one here where this is the VB Auto Center. Again, if you, uh, based upon whose classes you have taken, uh, you have uh, maybe have seen this program before. But regardless, uh, in this VB Auto Center uh, program, it's going to call get and validate input, uh, call calculate car price, and it's going to call dis display totals, okay? So this is a modularized uh, version of VB Auto Center, 
So regardless if you reviewed this or not in your uh, programming one class, this should s still look very familiar that we're calling, uh, you know, get input, calculate and display and passing it different types of data. OK, so when we talk about the term signature, let's look at get validate base price. This right here, this whole piece, OK, basically the parameters in which it's going to be received from a particular procedure in this case, aka method, all right, is what's called a signature. This is a signature. You got it? So in this case here, this is a signature for get and validate input. If we go down here a little bit more, uh, calculate, uh, calculate tax, this is the signature to calculate tax. So when you hear the term signature, it relates to really functions, uh, and but really uh, 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 programming, object-oriented programming, that's what we're referring to, all right? Hopefully that helps. That's a signature. Don't make it any more difficult than that. So when I sit back and say, we're basically going to be morphing this signature uh, to be able to accept various different types of, uh, uh, of inputs, that's what we're talking about. We're going to morph that. Right now, if you go back to programming one, and even what you did in uh, some of the assignments uh, prior to getting, getting the object oriented in this particular course, we basically passed data. It had to be one for one, meaning it had to line up in order. It had to be the exact same data type. It had to be double uh, and so on. And basically, it had to be you know exactly three things that it would be passed to. If you pass two to it, it wouldn't work. Polymorphism takes that whole concept and makes it a little bit more flexible. And so you can only accept a few things into many things. That's truly what it is. Instead of this being hard-coded like it is, and you have to be directly in polymorphism and building a class, we can take that signature and make it a little bit more flexible. All right? Let's get back to my uh, piece here. Let's see. I'll make this a little bit bigger. And we basically, there we are. Okay? Uh, so now that you kind of understand the whole idea of a signature, you also saw that a program that we must have the same number of arguments, and I said this, and the same data type for each argument that the receiving parameters are requiring. And if not, if we don't do that, you'll get an error. It basically won't even compile, won't even run. It'll just tell you it's an error. And so uh, that you must have those things lined up. You should recognize that and understand that by now, based upon what you've done in programming one, and even this class for, for the most part. Okay, let's continue on here. In class development, instead of being so rigid and instead of creating multiple methods that almost do the same thing, we can morph one method, an existing method, to be more flexible in how they receive parameters and their data types. I'm going to say it one more time. Read this along with me. In class development, instead of being so rigid, just like I said before, if I had three parameters, I must pass it three arguments. And instead of creating multiple, uh, and, and if, if, I, if those three uh, arguments are integer double double. They must be integer double double in the print in the signature line. Also, got it. But instead of being so rigid, and instead of creating multiple methods to almost do the same thing, so let's just say we have a method that, based upon what you send me, I'm going to do roughly the same thing, but quite not the same thing. Okay, I'm going to show you some examples here that hopefully will clear this up. But it's pretty close, uh, yet not exactly. Based upon a function, I would have to recreate a brand new function and call it a different name. If we morphed our function and object-oriented, I can keep the exact same name and just morph it to do what it is we need to be able to do. Does that make sense? Let's see. All right. So though it sounds kind of rocky, rocket science-y, science I don't know if that's a word or not. We'll say no. Uh, it is rather simple, yet it is actually very powerful. Okay. To get started, we can incorporate polymorphism in two ways in most languages, compile time and runtime, and that is the same for Python. Yay! Now, Python does it uh, actually more simple than VB uh, in this case. Uh, so you'll see how this is actually done. There's two types of polymorphism, compile time and runtime. Okay, and we'll talk about those from a VB perspective and then finally from a, uh, from a uh, Python perspective. Okay? Well, like everything else so far, VB and other languages, they do things differently. And that's the same thing as when it comes to polymorphism than it does with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, what can I say, with, with Python, okay? In VB at compile time, what we're going to do is a term called overloading methods, all right? And at runtime, we're going to override methods. 
In Python, we don't really overload methods. We actually, Python gives us a way of doing the exact same thing with a little bit more flexibility and ease. But at runtime in Python, we override methods, and you'll see what I mean by that, okay? So to do that, let's go ahead and look at uh, some uh, a website. I'm going to continue on with this. Once again, uh, this website's in the PowerPoint if you want to go and click on it. By, but also, uh, this website's available to you under resources for this particular week. All right? So let's see. I'm going to go ahead and get out of this. And... We will go here, okay? And this is kind of a crude little website, but it also, once I want you to, uh, to go through, it's easy to read. And again, compile time polymorphism and runtime polymorphism. How you do this in regards to, um, uh, how can I say, how do you do this in regards to VB and also I believe Java is on the compile side, we're going to be doing overloading methods. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at this particular class here. I have a public class, class called one. These examples on these pages are so well. Uh, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger for us. Let's see if I can, there you go. So well named, aren't they? With the uh, public I, J, and K as integers. And I guess you would know now if you see that public there, that means that it's, it's, it's available to the public, so thus it's not encapsulated, those particular variables so nicely named, I, J, and K. All right, well, we have this function here, okay? This would be a method, a public method, in which we would add diVal I as integer, okay? So basically what's happened here is, is that this is a method within our class, class called one, and we can call that from our, uh, from our program uh, that, that, the, um, that the application programmer would develop. And just by saying, uh, in this case, we develop a, let's see, we're going to instantiate one as two. This is great naming conventions, but one being, once again, the name of the class, and my object's going to be called two. Two dot add, and we just set it one parameter. As you see here also, there's a two dot add, sending it with two parameters, and a two dot add with three parameters. That makes sense? So this particular main piece is sending different parameters, well, very different than what we know about when it comes to functions and procedures that we have learned thus far. Meaning, I'll be dang, I'm using the exact same name of the method, add, okay, that's the exact same name, but passing it different parameters. How can I do that? Well, in VB, you do that by overloading, which means this. I have, I create three different uh, uh, functions, all with the same name within my class, with different signatures for each. Isn't that cool? And here's what happens in VB. When you compile this and then you instantiate this, the CLR in .NET, CLR stands for the Common Language Runtime. It basically is the mechanism that runs all .NET programs. will determine what the parameters are and line it up to the correct function within the class. Well, I shouldn't say function. I should say method within the class. So if I pass it two, it will automatically go here to the add. If I pass it three, it will automatically go here to this add. One right here. I can, this overloading basically is very simple and I can do this as many times as I like. I can rename the exact same function over and over again. I can have different data types uh, in my signature here. So maybe if my uh, person sends me different types of data types, I can handle that accordingly. Uh, maybe if they send me strings, I would, in this one, I, instead of just returning I plus J plus K, I would actually have to validate to make sure the string they send me is numeric. And then make and then put that into something that I can actually add against. Make sense? So I can be very flexible in doing this, and that's polymorphism from a compile time point of view. Okay, I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller, and that's exactly what this is doing. 10, 10, 20, 10, 20, 30. One thing I noticed on this website, and I do apologize for that, but I still like how simply it actually shows you this, is that the output is actually wrong. <laughs> So whoever developed this developed the wrong output. The output for this, the very first one would be 10. The next one would actually be 30. And the next one would be uh, 10 plus 20 plus 30, 60. And so 60 would actually go there. Uh, so don't look at the output and get confused, please. It's basically supposed to be 10, 30, then 60. Uh, I guess they typed that in when they were trying to make a point here. Okay? That's overloading. Pretty slick, huh? 
All right. Once again, that's not how you do it in Python. Uh, so don't worry about it if you don't completely understand it. Python does it even more simple than this. But this is what you would see in, in a .NET world. OK, if you want to provide polymorphism to your class. Again, it's an option. You don't have to do it. Another form of polymorphism is runtime uh, polymorphism. And this one is actually a little bit easier. It this deals with uh, inheritance. OK. And so in this case here, we have a public class called poly, all right, where there's a method in there called show, and it's going to write hello in there, okay? Hello with a W. Why? I have no idea, okay? And so what this is saying is if I inherit, this is how you inherit in VB, okay, not like you do it in Python, this is how you inherit in VB, I can take that exact same method that I'm inheriting and actually rework it. So I can use the same name, kind of override it. That's what we're saying, override, R-I-D-E, overriding the method. And that also is a form of polymorphism. So I inherit the, the method I'm inheriting. I can actually rewrite to do something different. And that's considered overriding. I don't find that nearly as powerful, but basically what we're saying here is, is I might have a method, and, I'm sorry, I might have a class in which I like several of the things that are in there, okay? Maybe all the data and majority of, of, of the methods, but there's one or two methods I would want to change for my particular situation as I inherit it. And that allows you to do that in this case. And so it's just, it's don't pretend there's just one method here. Let's pretend there's a lot of data and a lot of methods, but this particular method I wanna change for my particular purpose and I can do that. And that's considered polymorphism also from a runtime perspective. Not quite as powerful, but once again, that's what polymorphism is. Does that make sense? Okay. Once again, please look at that. Read over that. Uh, I know I go through these things rather quickly. Uh, your job is to listen to me and then maybe go back and relook at those things once again and make sure you understand. I think it's going to make a little bit more sense to you now that uh, we get into Python. You kind of look at it here. Okay. Python does things a little bit uh, differently. But they still do compile time, and it still does run time. Uh, when it comes to the overriding, it's identical. Uh, we can inherit in a, uh, a, a we'll inherit in a, a particular um, uh, class, uh, you know, a subclass, and then we can actually change also. So I'm going to take you to Geeks for Greeks for polymorphism in Python. We'll go there uh, to kind of look at this. So let's go back out here. And what you will see is this. What is polymorphism? This particular article is a really good article. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple things. And I want you to avoid a couple things. Polymorphism with class methods. You can read this. I don't really like it. I think it's, it's a little bit of a stretch. Uh, but polymorphism with inheritance, this is method overriding. As you can see here, we have a class called bird with a, with a method called intro and a method called flight, right? And it says these are many types of birds and flight, most of these birds can fly, but some cannot. Look at this class called sparrow. We're actually overriding the, and we inherit bird, all right? And so we're overriding, if you will, flight. Sparrows can fly. Same thing under ostriches. Kind of a weird example, but I hope you get the idea. What we're saying here is, is that we can inherit an entire class and we can override the methods if it doesn't do exactly what I want in my in my base class of which I'm, I'm inheriting. OK, uh, two. OK, makes sense. Take a look at that. OK, the other thing, then we'll go back to the compile time uh, version of this. If you remember VB, we over we uh, we basically overloaded. Correct. And so in this case here, we had bival uh, and with two pieces here, three pieces here. And Python is actually a little bit more simple. If you recall back when we were doing uh, functions, uh, Python had an option to basically you can actually set default default uh, parameters within the signature, meaning this x, y, and z equals zero. So in this case, if I pass just two parameters, z will be zero. It'll still add them all together, but in this case, z will be zero. If I pass all three, the four of them would overtake whatever the default was. So I can literally have a, uh, I, I can have a, a method in Python that has defaults for every one of my parameters out there. 
Okay, maybe it's zero, maybe it's a different number, whatever it is. And then if I want to, based upon the parameters passed to me, it will overlay those, okay? And so if you actually go back and look at Python in regards to uh, functions and how they receive data, you can do it this way. You can actually do it a couple different ways. Python is very flexible with their, uh, with their uh, functions and their signatures. But to me, this right here is identical to how VB does it with overloading methods. In our case, all we do is set defaults, and then if the defaults are zero, we can accept one, two, three, four, ten, based upon how many of these would be defaults. Again, in this case, my default would need to be, if I only wanted to accept one, I would have to make y equals zero, too. Okay? Uh, if I was crazy enough to, to accept no parameters, I would have to make x equal to zero also. Then basically all three would be zero and the return would be zero in that case. Does that make sense? Hopefully. All right. If I want to add more parameters, I can default whatever. This particular situation is basically saying this particular um, uh, function or this particular method will only, well, must accept x and y. So there must be x and y there or will not work. But z is optional. That's why I can pass it either two or three, and thus the concept of polymorphism. My, um, my method can handle multiple signatures, and that's what that's for. What do you think? That's, that's how you do it in Python. A little bit more simple, maybe not as powerful as a VB or a Java, but can still get the job done, okay? All right? And, you know, if you sit back and go back and say, well, how can it handle multiple data types? Well, if you look at that one more time, remember how job, you know, in VB, you had to define the data type in the signature. In Python, you do not. And so it can handle any data type uh, you want to send to it. And then basically we need to handle that within our, uh, our method itself based upon if we want to check to make sure X is numeric or X is greater than zero or whatever you want to do. All right. Does that make sense? It's actually fairly simple. Once again, please read this, but please, when you read this, do not read this part about polymorphism with class methods. I don't want you to get confused. It's kind of neat what they're doing, but it takes it to kind of a level you don't really have to get, get into. And it also gets into lists and arrays in which we're actually not talking about yet in, in this course. Okay? Cool. But you can take a look at it, but just make sure I, you understand that I warned you not to get too confused. Polymorphism with inheritance. And then uh, polymorphism in, uh, in a polymorphic functions, okay, which is basically the same as overloading. That's what I want you to look at. All right. All right. And that is polymorphism. Not too bad, hopefully. I, once again, these pillars that we talked about from inheritance to encapsulation to polymorphism are all things that uh, are... Uh, really more an option to developing your class. You don't have to have them in your classes. You can have one, you can have two, you can use them all, but it's not necessary. It's just basically options to make your classes more popular, okay? And so, I mean, and in doing so, basically we were saying that, you know, if you want to make it more reusable, that's inheritance. If you want to make it more foolproof to ensure that an application programmer can't mess up uh, the data being provided to the class, that's encapsulation. If you want to make it more flexible, polymorphism. See, I hope so. I hope that doesn't, I'm making it easier versus harder. All right. Uh, and uh, there you go. All right. So there you have it. Now you should have a good basic foundation of object-oriented programming and the pillars of object-oriented programming. I put a question mark there, hoping the answer is yes, you do. Okay. That's it. That's object-oriented programming in a nutshell from the concepts. Uh, now it's time to keep practicing, and that's what we'll do the rest of this course, okay? So if you have more questions, let your instructor know.